Okay, so this is for chapter five for microbiology from the sixth edition of uh, Cohen and Smith. And what you guys need to focus on for this chapter is the whole first section, sections 5.1 through 5.3, should all be reviewed from Bio 1. It is basically going through a eukaryotic cell and talking about all the individual organelles in the cell and their functions. And there will be multiple choice questions about this on the exam, okay? The other key point from the beginning of chapter five is I would go through and make a list of comparing a prokaryotic cell, what you learned in chapter four, to a eukaryotic cell, right? Sort of a list of what, they sh what features they share in common and what features are different. Now, the last part of chapter five, very briefly, section starting with section 5.4 it's about fungus fungus protists and helminths which are actually animals they are all eukaryotes and they are all part of microbiology they're all part of that survey of the organisms that we're going to talk about in microbiology that we looked at in chapter one so that's the reason we're highlighting these particular organisms so i wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the specifics about fungus protists and the helmets that are important for you to know for the exam. So let's start with fungus. And what I'd like to do, I think would be the easiest, is if I would just put a list of some of the terminology that you're going to need uh, to know about fungus. Okay. So for fungi, which is the plural of fungus, right? You need to remember they're eukaryotic. And there are lots, there's lots of vocabulary for fungus. So hypha or hyphae is the plural, I believe. That's the main structure or the cell of a fungus. And they form these thread-like chains that we refer to as a filaments. Sometimes they can uh, contain uh, the divisions between the individual cells and the hyphae are called sexae. And uh, sometimes they can be completely separated or they can be almost separated, which we call pseudo-septate or non-septate hyphae. Now, this is the structure of a fungus. There are micro, you can, um, they are micro, there are microscopic portions. Most fungi grow underground or in a medium and that they have a microscopic part of their life cycle and a macroscopic so that you can, you know, the part that you can see with your naked eye, right? Like a mushroom, that's obviously macroscopic. Fungi for nutrition, they live pretty much everywhere. We refer to them as they are a special category of chemoheterotrophs. That means, of course, chemoheterotroph means that they use organic molecules to produce energy as well as their carbon source. Again, something you should know from bio one. In particular, we call them saprobes. Um, saprobes means that they feed on uh, in, uh, on organic material that is dead, right, or dying. So that's why they feed on skin as in humans primarily, right, or the trunk of a tree if you see them out in the, in the world. They are classified by their spores, and they make two different types of spores, which is a little confusing. They produce asexual spores which you'll see in your textbook, there is a whole category of asexual spores on page 124. I'm not gonna ask you to be able to identify the different types. What you do need to remember is an asexual spore is basically a tiny cell or piece of hyphae that can recreate the whole um, growing mycelium of a fungus. The sexual spores, that's how they're actually um, put into, these are gonna be haploid, right? Or N, 
right? So those are for sexual reproduction where one spore type is going to fuse with another spore type to form a zygote. That's how they're actually put into their classification as far as um, like their taxonomy. That's how they get put into different categories or clades or divisions. Phyla, I guess I should say. As far as um, where they grow, let's back up here with their nutrition, I guess we should say that they um, can withstand higher pH, higher acidic conditions than bacteria, as well as um, usually you find them more frequently in the environment than on um, plants or on animals are predominantly more prevalent in the environment. Um, and then I would make a separate category where I would uh, put things about um, interactions between uh, fungi and humans. And I would put, I would make yourself a list of sort of uh, positive interactions versus uh, what we would consider negative interactions, right? So on this list, I would put things like, do it. Sorry. All right, so on this list then I would put things like, okay, for a positive benefit of fungus, right, they provide us with food, they provide us with antibiotics, so pharmaceuticals, they provide us with alcohol, they provide us with um, lots of vitamins actually are produced in fungus. And then on the negative side, of course, they can cause disease, they can cause damage to crops, uh, as well as they can deteriorate things that we want to preserve. And they can also produce toxins and those toxins are pretty um, strong and some of them are fatal. So I would make, I would fill out that list. There's a pair, couple paragraphs you can read about in the book that would um, help you with that. And let's see if I can show you some pictures of fungus from my, um, wait, sorry. Yeah, from my computer. If they download it. Mm -hmm. oh, they're not a label. Okay, let's see if you can see these. It's going to have a hard time doing all this. Oh, that's fungus. Wow, it was pretty close. I can make it big. That button. There we go. So here's a fungal cell, and this is actually uh, yeast, and they're making what we would call a pseudohyphae because the cells, they're each individual, their own cells, and this is would be asexual reproduction in the form of a bud, which means this cell is exactly genetically identical to the parent cell. So that's in a yeast. Let's see if I thought there was a way that I could uh, just click forward and back from these. Ugh. I guess not. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go one back then. It's not gonna let me do that. So this is the picture directly from your book, right, that has these, um, pictures of fungus microscopically. So you can see this is a hyphae. And when the hyphae form a network like this, we refer to it as a mycelium. And this obviously is microscopic. And the septum is what's dividing these cells from each other in, the, in a filament, right? Looks like I can maybe, guess not. Okay, so I wanted to show you those two. And I also wanted to show you the picture of the foot of the person. that one. There it is. So there's some fungus growing on a straw on some raspberries and then here's some athlete's foot. Of course, remember always the pictures in your textbook are going to be the most severe cases of what has ever been documented of a particular infection, right? So this is, this is severe um, athlete's foot where the fungus is growing in the dead layers of the skin. 
and here's of course some of uh, my family that are reproducing on some fruit, right? All right, so that's enough about fungus. Let's talk a little bit about protists and the protists that are of importance for microbiology. And let's see here, go back to a whiteboard. All right, so protists. I would again remind they are eukaryotes. Right? They are often uh, unicellular, but they don't have to be. They can be multicellular. And most of them are free, what we'd say free living. Right? The ones that we're concerned with in microbiology are often what we would call parasites. So these are also a category of chemoheterotrophs. But they, um, they're defined by living, uh, by digesting, uh, using living cells for their living organisms, for their source of carbon, and for their source of energy. A lot of them are going to be, they're free living, they're going to live mostly in water and soil. where they can get all their nutrients. Many of them are going to be modal. So they can swim around, right? This motility could be in terms of a flagella, cilia, or um, pseudopodia, like in an amoeba. And I would remind you that the cilia and flagella are constructed differently than the flagella in bacteria. This picture is important that I would like to show you. Um, if I can. Don't know why that is. The other one, let me do that. See if I can get some protist pictures going here. Oh, still fungus. This one. There we go. There's some protists. Uh, this looks like a giardia, maybe infecting your intestine. Here's an amoeba with its pseudopodia, right? This would be a flagella. These look like stentor with their cilia, as well as a paramecium, which you've seen before in uh, bio. So this is 522. So let me go for uh, 523 here. This is the picture that I would really like you to see and focus on. So this talks about the different stages of a protist's life cycle. And this is not particularly important for protists that are going to be parasitic or are going to affect you as a human. And, um, whoops, why don't I do that? There we go. Oh, you can't see the picture, sorry. Was it just the protist that you couldn't see or any of them? Can you see this one? You can see that one, right? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. You can see them in your book. Um, they're, you'll just, if you just look at the pictures in your book while you listen to the, that part of the lecture, you'll just be like, oh, she was talking about the foot and the raspberries, there they are. So this picture is particularly important for the protus because it has the um, different life stages of a protist. So the feeding stage has a special name. It's called a trophozoite. And similar to when a bacteria is stressed, if there's new, no nutrients or if they get dried up, they form what we call a cyst. And these cysts are similar to endospores in that they are somewhat resistant to the environment. Not usually as much as bacterial endospores, but they do resist um, some disinfection procedures. And then this is the cool picture because it's showing the cyst breaking open and the actively growing form coming out again. And this would be like, oh, I drank some pond water and I ingested some cysts. 
and the organism is now in a wonderful environment in my intestine and it's saying, oh, let's come out and uh, cause an infection, right? So let's see if I can go back and show you some more of those pictures. But that was one of the ones that I really wanted to show you. And then, oh, let's see if we can find these pictures of the uh, helmets, because that's where we're going next. Yeah, here we go. So let me think if there's anything else about protozoans that I want to tell you. I think that's most of it. This picture sort of sums up the helmets. Again, I would remind you that these guys are you guys can see this, right? Just the list. Oh, okay. Sorry. This one. There. Now you can see it, right? My apologies. So these are, <laughs> thanks Lauren for keeping me on task here. Um, so these are some of the major groups of helmets and this is a tapeworm here, and this is a fluke in these two pictures. This is what it looks like microscopically. This is the uh, artist rendition of the fluke. This, again, same with the tapeworm. This is what it actually looks like. They can grow to be quite long. The important parts are the head here, the scolex that actually attaches to your intestine, and then these further segments down here that contain um, both immature and fertile eggs. These particular helmets to the tapeworms, they are hermaphroditic. So they actually contain both sexes and they fertilize themselves. And then they release fertilized eggs that then you would ingest as um, a new host. Now, one of the important things to know about the helmets is that in order for them to be infectious, they're usually not. Um, humans are usually not always, are usually not the, what we call the definitive host. So you're an accidental host. So sometimes they can't complete their whole life cycle in you unless you're closely related to their natural host. Okay. And helmets. These are animals. They're um, worms, both round worms, what we refer to sort of in casual terms as round worms and flat worms. Right, so they're eukaryotes and they're more complicated and they're more like you. They're more, because they're animals, they're more closely related to you than fungus or the protists. So they're more difficult to treat as far as once you get an infection. Um, what else do I want to tell you about the worms? Other than they're really difficult to treat, um, the incidence of intestinal worms, uh, helminth infections, infections is uh, really high worldwide. Right. It has to do with clean water and your sewage being far enough away from your water because oftentimes they're spread from the feces of an animal or the feces of one person to another person. Which brings me to this darling picture of these little girls that are sharing their pinworms. So I wanted to show you that picture. Let me see if I can find that one. Five point five. Yes, this guy. So now if I go back to my, I know you can't see it yet. I'm working on it. Let me share. I wanna share this one with you. There it is. See if I can make it large. So these are this little girl here, right? She's probably, you know, fairly young, 
fairly school age or preschool age. And this is a pinworm infection. We're showing you the male and the female pinworm. They actually have the sexes are separate, but the male pinworm actually lives uh, embedded inside the female pinworm. So they constantly fertilize the eggs and they're in her intestine because she picked them up and put them in her mouth. Right, and then this fertilized egg hatched into a worm, and then they actually migrate, the adults migrate, the eggs migrate to the edge of the anus where they emerge, and then you have a little itchy bottom, and when you scratch your bottom, then she's self-inoculating more of them because she itched her bottom, or she's playing with her little friend here, or, and they're um, sharing a toy, or they're hanging out together, and then the other little girl will put her hands in her mouth, and then um, the infection will be passed on. Um, this one in particular is fairly easily treated, but if you're a parent or a young parent, if you have a young child, you may have gotten um, <laughs> you may have gotten the notice uh, home from a teacher or from school that says um, a child in your son slash daughter's classroom has been diagnosed with whipworm or pinworm, and please check you know watch your child for uh, these signs and symptoms, particularly an itchy bottom, hence the expression ants in your pants. Right, and then obviously seek medical treatment, and you can uh, take in a drug that will kill the infection. But you'd have to maybe be out of school for a couple of days if you were um, on the young side. So um, we always show that one to just remind people how easy it is to transmit something uh, accidentally. Um, although we're much more all more <laughs> more aware of that now than we used to be, but I like to show that particular one. And there's also a short table in your book that lists a few of the nematodes and worms that are of importance as far as microbial diseases. You don't need to know their names and their specific diseases at this point. The point is just to show you a little bit about their complex life cycle and for you to remember their general characteristics. We'll talk about them individually when we get to intestinal diseases. We'll go through a whole bunch of parasites. So that's just on hold for later. And that is pretty much the end of what I intended to cover for chapter five. So I'm going to